thank you for coming to this session, which is about AI and medicine and misinformation, although I think we're going to cover perhaps slightly broader space than that. Um, I think as everybody here knows, uh, the whole space of AI was really transformed in this year. And most people are thinking that this promises to be as disruptive a change as the internet might be. So we anticipate that there are going to be a lot of questions. We're going to begin by asking each of the panelists a few questions about sort of the past, present, and future, as well as some of the potential things to be concerned about. Um, and when possible, we're going to ask GPT the same question. We actually have already done that so that it's on the slide. Um, by the way, show of hands, how many people here have used a large language model? Excellent. How many people haven't? OK. Um, I'll give you the usual speech I give people before we start, which is to say you should, because the technology is moving so quickly, and th this, there is support of the, for this statement, that if you don't do it now, you will likely be very confused in a year when the next round of technologies based on the thing you haven't used are out there. So I would highly recommend that you get used to it, understand prompt engineering, and just play a little bit so that you can speak in, with inform informativeness about the topic. So I'll begin by asking this esteemed group of people questions, st starting with Abba. Can you describe a little bit about the benefits of where you think AI would help, AI will help healthcare, and cite some examples of that? Sure, thank you. Good afternoon. I just want to start by saying this is my first ABIM forum, and I want to thank ABIM and the foundation for the opportunity. Well, I want to give examples of what I think is happening right now or could be happening in near future as opposed to, you know, five, ten years down. So the first thing, we talked a lot about the physician burnout and the crushing burden of documentation that has been imposed by EHR. It being generative AI, uh, something like chat GPT, I, it's already, it's capable of doing that. It can be present in the ambience, in the clinical exam room, and at the end of the physician-patient uh, encounter, has the ability to automatically create all the documentation, you know, the SOAP note for the physician or a better formatted note, after visit summary for the patient, codes for the coders, claims for the billers, consultations, diagnostic testing. That itself, I think we talked a lot about burnout. We talked a lot about, you know, transactional care to relational care. And I think by relieving physicians of that time for documentation and all the non-clinical tasks, it can really help us potentially, potentially restore relational care. The other example I can think of in a very practical manner, which even our hospital, community hospital of, of, is thinking of implementing, is sort of using image-based AI for very quick, rapid diagnosis for triage purposes. So stroke patients, it's a very good use case. It can look at your initial non-contrast CT and within one minute, figure out whether the patient has an infarct or a hemorrhage and you can make then a decision very quickly for you know, TPA or transferring the patient out. Typically, it would take a re regular radiologist, as you know, in the best case scenario, 20, 25 minutes. So that can be a truly time saver and potential brain saver for a stroke patients. I think the third thing I want to just acknowledge Marianne Green for pointing me toward this predictive analytics, not only generative. It is beginning, we are beginning to see case studies where AI can predict outcomes. So this paper from NYU Langone came, came in June, um, seventh issue of Nature. They looked at thousands of, you know, 300,000 or so of clinical notes um, and were able to do a very accurate prediction of uh, uh, all-cause readmission, inpatient mortality, and length of stay. I want to say one thing on that particular thing that is significantly different from rule-based models that we have had right now. What's different about AI, right? We could have done it before. AI can look at unstructured data in the EHR, and that to me is a very crucial difference. And 80% of the data in EHR, especially in clinical notes and discharge summaries and radiology reports is all unstructured. So up until AI or large language models or clinical language models, we were not able to use that for making clinical decisions or predictions. So that I think is a significant breakthrough in terms of what we can mine from EHR or clinical data. I thought, I wasn't thinking, it was not in my notes, but after yesterday's and today's session, how can we use it for spreading credible information, right, as opposed to misinformation? 
And there was a lot of discussion about barriers to credible information. People who have been maybe spreading misinformation are using these uh, social media platforms from TikTok to YouTube shorts far more effectively. And then we have so many barriers, financial barriers, resource barriers for us to create. So I was wondering, since it's generative AI, it has the ability to not only generate text that you will show us in chat GPT, it can also generate images, it can also generate videos, it can also generate text to speech videos. So I'm just thinking, could I take a very, very nice, credible information text and say, hey, can you generate a one minute TikTok style video for this? And if we can do it successfully and test it, then we have the scale to generate hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands credible videos and I almost think flood the internet with credible information and kind of be you know, at a some advantage in the info wars. Um, my last piece, it's not maybe not important, but very important to me as a healthcare executive, you always have to look for business case and saving money. And I think it's being used effectively for um, administrative tasks. The risk is lower. I know you will talk a lot about risks, you know, claims, denials, Although insurance companies are gonna fight AI with AI denial, denial of denials, et cetera, et cetera. But I came across a use case study from Missouri and they created an AI bot and they put it in their HIM department and it was processing all their medical record requests from patients and legal professionals and was saving, you know, a couple of uh, staff salaries. So let me stop here. I hope I've given you a flavor of uh, what generative and predictive AI can do for now. Last thing, everything I have said has a caveat and a risk, and I'm sure we'll be talking plenty yeah. about that, right? <laughs> Absolutely, thank yeah. you. Bindi, anything that you would add? Um, so actually, I you know come from medical education, and so um, I do wanna add, before I get into risk later, is um, how, as medical educators, we always think about risk, but what are the benefits? Um, one thing you may not know, I also oversee simulation um, at University of Chicago and, and you know, is an amazing tool. We're not using it enough in um, training um, healthcare workforce. And, it, you know, AI can really help us reduce time to create simulations, create personalized simulations. So just as Abba was talking about these videos, these TikTok videos, you could actually take text scripts, illness scripts, and use um, AI to create many different types of patients, virtual patients that your students or residents could interact with and make sure that you actually have, you know, certified them as they are, they are ready to ready for practice. And so wanted to, to highlight that we are just scratching the surface. And, and also, um, you know, we have VR, AR technology now um, not being widely used, uh, but again, another place where you can actually use AI to actually create VR, AR scenarios. Could you just say a second about what VR and v AR Virtual is? reality and augmented reality. So we're at the point where, um, you know, people can, you know, put on headsets and you could actually be transported into a clinical environment. Um, the same, this is all things that are going on in our medical school and sim centers and with standardized patients, you could actually start creating some of this through technology and very high fidelity type of work that you could be moving in. And so I think that chat, you know, with all due respect to our chat GBT four panelists here, I think that the real, um, the real value is gonna be in the next generation of applying AI to those um, high fidelity scenarios and seeing how that would impact um, learning and training. Thank you. Michael, anything else? I don't, I don't know that we know yet. Um, you know, if you haven't looked at it in healthcare, uh, McKinsey just shared publicly a nice report that kind of goes through the practical use cases that are likely to be um, very high value in the healthcare context in the next, you know, n number of months and n number of years. I think the the speed at which things are getting better is remarkable. So, you know, my sense is we've seen more progress in AI in 10 months than in 10 years. It's very clear that we're in an exponential at the moment, and it's very hard to predict your way out of an exponential. And so this is great, I can't believe I'm gonna quote Bill Gates, but I am. Um, this, is a great, this is a great quote by Bill Gates, and we always overestimate the amount of change in the next two years and underestimate the amount in 10. Um, 
But I think we feel like this is a fundamental change in the way that human beings interact with computers. And the last time that happened was mobile, um, and the time before that was the internet. And I think it's, in, it's at that scale for us. Let's see what ChatGPT has to say. So improved patient care, uh, fast analyses, personalized treatments, enhancing outcomes, increased accessibility, which we didn't talk about as much, Eff uh, efficiency and cost reduction, which we did, predictive analytics, uh, predictive analysis, which Abba mentioned, and drug discovery, which is another area that we, we didn't talk about very much. But it is true that there are some technologies, and we thought, well, let's just make sure that it's thought that through by giving us some examples. <laughs> now, someone among you is going, there are hallucinations in there. Yeah. <laughs> and there aren't. I checked every single one of these, and they're all accurate. So now you're all saying, wow, this is pretty amazing. So Vinny, bring us back down to earth. What are some of the things we should be concerned about? And give us some examples if you have any. Sure. And then we'll all chime in. Thank you. Um, I love this question because as a dean, your best friend is a lawyer, and you're always trained to think about the worst of the worst uh, that comes to your office. So, um, so I think obviously the things that keep us up at night um, are privacy issues, right? I mean, not just as an individual, but as an organization, you know, feeding these, um, you, know, uh, you know, AI models patient data, educational data, even privacy is sort of like, think about the questions that you have fed chat GPT. Would you want your family, colleagues, students, patients to know what you're asking chat GPT? So, um, so there's a lot up there in the privacy space. And then also um, that could be used to perpetuate identity theft, you know, and what we're talking about is, um, you know, what I've seen is, uh, you know, the AI models, they could create a video of ABBA. It would look like ABBA telling us something that ABBA doesn't believe, right? So it would perpetuate that misinformation through, through co-opting. Um, I also think of um, another, uh, you, you mentioned hallucinations, Kevin, and I uh, saw the 60 Minutes episode on AI, uh, which uh, was super fascinating where they asked um, ChatGPT to, you know, create a reference list. Pretty easy thing. And, you know, think about we do that all the time. And um, but some of the references that they like spit out were wrong. You know, they were like fa fabricated. And this, you know, you probably have heard there were some high profile cases that occurred. So you can't just rely on the information that it gives. And why is it fabricating? Is it because it's learning to be human? <laughs> um, is it because it's shortcutting? I don't know. I don't know that we know the answer. I would defer to other experts here. But is it going to fabricate more, you know, and the more we give it? And so, um, so that leads to, like, over-trust is a serious problem, is do we over-trust the computer? And especially in medicine, you know, when we're looking for ways to shortcut, as Abba said, and, you know, things that we can um, to lean on to avoid burnout, will we depend too much on it such that it's been trained on either fabricating or trained on data, maybe current data. It's trained on current data, which gives us inequitable outcomes. Like, why would we use ChatGPT and AI to create a system that's like the system we have today? You know, we should be thinking about a better system. And so I do worry a uh, little bit about the, you know, how do you actually use it to drive improvement and could you be left with the status quo? Um, and then I think another obviously key um, element of, of this is um, knowledge, um, you know, um, loss. Uh, and this reminds me of when electronic health records came. I think we all remember some of the attendings in our organizations will be like, no one will know how to admit a patient anymore using the acronym ADC Van Dizzle. And, um, you know, I think it's okay because, you know, we all have smartphones, right? And so, oh, no. uh, yeah. And so, um, so now the question though now is, um, you know, in medical education, we, we use the RHYME framework, reporter, interpreter, manager, educator. And I would say, unfortunately, Unfortunately, a lot of our early students are there at the reporter level, and I do think like ChatGPT is going to be a better reporter of what took place in a patient encounter than than a medical student. And so, how do we reframe roles so that we don't displace ourselves even? Um, and so, those are just some of the the risks that I foresee. Um, and not to mention, I'm not even touching upon the fact that patients are going to come 
not maybe with their bypassing us already because ChatGPT will have told them their diagnosis as well as where to get treated and somebody who will treat them even if it wouldn't be us. So lots of risks there. So Michael, thank you, Vinny. Uh, Vinny brought up one thing that I think is important. Since you're from Google, I recognize we should be talking about Bard, and I know that Sundai has done a really good Sundai's done a very good job on podcasts of talking about some of the things that have slowed down Google's decisions about releasing what Bard is capable of doing. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So you know, I 20 years of academic medicine, and then came to Google. And when I came to Google. I didn't really know how to hire doctors, and so I was on the engineering research scientist ladder, and I got put into the part of Google that invents new kinds of machine learning and AI for Google to use. And so I had all these people who were like inventing all the stuff, and when I didn't understand, I could like grab them and like put them in a room and be like, "Can you explain an embedding space to me?" Like, you know, the person who published the foundational paper in it, um, and in about about eight months after I started, uh, the team published this paper called Attention is All You Need on the Transformers. And I'm from Gen X, so I'll just tell all the other Gen X people, not Autobots and Decepticons, but a clever way of handling some really complicated problems. Um, Transformers is the T in GPT. Um, that paper's been cited 85,000 times. It's that important. And everyone's like, oh, this is really different. We didn't really understand it. Um, we started adding more compute on top of it and started seeing um, new capabilities that had not existed before and that never existed in human history inside of a computer. And we've been um, working on how to bring that to let people use it in a safe way because the capabilities are very different. And so we published, Sundar wrote the, the announcement blog of this in 2018, um, Google's AI principles. And in 2018, everyone looked at us and was like, really? Um, and it's been one of the anchor points on how we think about releasing AI uh, to, be, to people. And you know, there, there's a great example for these things of, Sundar will say, let me back up for a second. So the three, three generations of AI, so this is not official in any way, but it's shorthand in my head. AI 1.0 was like IBM Deep Blue, a million if-then rules and some search algorithms, amazing. AI 2.0 is 2011 to last year, which is the era of deep learning. All the things of like, I can search my photos without, ever, anybody remember having to tag your photos with like cat and child? And I can search my photos. 99% uh, of email that's sent is spam, and you don't get 99% of your, all those things. Uh, diabetic retinopathy, mammography reading, all of that is a deep learning. It's been amazing. We solved protein folding uh, de um, with deep learning. This kind of AI is trained very differently. And so it's a little wonky, but you know, like you don't really need to know that kidneys exist in order to follow JNC aid guidelines for hypertension, but it probably is helpful to know that kidneys exist. Sometimes it's helpful to know a little under the hood. So these things are trained mostly by reading everything they can and predicting the next word. Um, and that creates a huge number of prediction tasks, trillions of prediction tasks. And then they have a representation of the, of the semantic structure and they move all that around. But when you ask ChatGPT or Bard or Claude with Anthropic um, you know, to do something, all it's doing is predicting the next word in this, this in, uh, embedding space that it has all these concepts in. So if you only remembered one thing, it does not go to PubMed and look things up. It do, it, there's some tricks that I'll tell you about. It doesn't go to a calculator and ask a calculator. They do now, but they didn't to start. It just guesses what looks like a plausible next word and gives you a structure that looks like a citation. So it predicts the next word. Now, soon to, let me go back to your question. So AI 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. Here we're talking mostly about 3.0. Totally different set of capabilities. Um, Sundar has this great um, sentence in one of the Verge uh, interviews where he says, 
well, there's some things you don't want it to make up. You don't need a sonnet when you're asking what is pediatric drug dosing. You want it to look up pediatric dr drug dosing. Um, and so, so we've been working really hard on these three technical areas called grounding, consistency, and attribution of how do you show the work so that you can show citations and uh, at, at least mitigate these errors. And so we've, uh, we've been criticized for um, uh, going slow since we've had this stuff laying around for a couple of years. Thank you. Any final points about that? I think I want to add a couple of the... Uh, I, mean, have, Mike. I want to add... Is it off, Mark? Okay. I want to add a couple more uh, risks or caveats. I think bias is one thing that we want to talk about. What, how AI can potentially exacerbate bias. And to me, it's not as much about the algorithms being biased, which is true, but it is what is the food for algorithm, which is all the digital content, which is us and our thoughts and what we have produced on the internet, that being biased, which is what produces the biased output. I want to share with you guys a story about bias. This is very personal. I was writing a non-academic fun book, Experience of Being a Parent, 13 Gifts for My Son, Subtitle for a Meaningful Life. I said, let me go to chat GPT, GPT-4, and see if they can give me a better title. So I wrote a few sentences about this book, say, here's my title, can you give me a better title, thinking it's far smarter. And it gave me about 12 suggested titles. I took a screenshot, put it on LinkedIn. All the titles were about gifts from a father to a son. Because according to all the content on the internet and word prediction, only fathers give gifts to sons. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> here I am. Anyway, just want to use that example to say how what we have thought about life is what's giving, what might possibly give. And the, the uh, possibilities are endless all the race, ethnicity, all the stuff we talked about this morning, as you can imagine how it can exacerbate. The other is the risk of synthetic data. You mentioned that as we produce AI chat GPT data, a lot of people are now publishing chat GPT's output, what you are showing, on the internet as primary output. So all my secondary stuff has now become primary stuff, and chat GPT is gonna ingest the secondary stuff, its own generated content. Right, like what we call the snake eating its tail. Is it gonna be that in one year, I don't know, I'm not talking 10 years, 80% of the content chat GPT is analyzing and processing is synthetic chat GPT generated content, then I don't know how this would, the output would look like. And maybe finally, I, I don't know, I'm not reading this somewhere, but maybe I'm too paranoid like you, Vinny, you know? <laughs> I mean, could this, a bad actor program a smart IV pump through AI and give 10 times the dose of insulin or 100 times the dose of potassium get infused into a patient? Uh, this is your analog to, you know, chat GPT being used for nefarious activities. Could I remotely, you know, turn off somebody's pacemaker and could they suffer an adverse outcome this way? Anyway, you can call me a total paranoid now, but I worry about those scenarios with AI. I, I've seen the Terminator, Abba. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I should stop watching movies. I think I get it. But anyway, those are my thoughts on, on the risks. But well, those are good thoughts. Let's see what GPT-4 has to say. This bottom part, for people who don't know, is a prompt. That prompt and every word in that prompt helps GPT to figure out its response. I think if you read what Peter Lee from Microsoft has written about GPT, one of the things you'll likely find out is that there were some early experiments that were done that I think are published in a thing called a scorecard that actually specifically refer to nefarious activities that could be done that they tried to get it to do. And when it got far enough that people had concern, the coders actually blocked the ability to do that. I won't go through that list, but it's available online if you'd like to see it. And I think the point to be made, and one of the reasons why Sam Altman from OpenAI recommended that we slow things down is this list of negatives to make sure that we understand how to mitigate that risk. And obviously anything that we can do in any other domain 
is going to be magnified in, in medicine because it is so much more sensitive to perturbations. Uh, we have one final question that I want to open it up to you, which is, Michael's already had a chance to tell us a bit, but Michael, what's the future hold? What do you see in the next one year, five years, notwithstanding what uh, Professor Gates taught us? I'll give you an optimistic view and a pessimistic view. Um, my optimistic view is that this technology lets us democratize and scale expertise in a way that brings health and healthcare to billions of people at a marginal cost per encounter that is almost free. I think that's a possibility here. And it's, some people here have known me for a long time, not actually natively a, a technology optimist. Um, you would never have heard me come here and say the words block and chain in the same sentence. Um, but these capabilities are fundamentally different, and we've seen some evidence uh, that, they, that they are. Um, I think in a slightly more concrete thing, I think that five years, many of us are gonna have in our pocket on our phones the equivalent of a chief of staff. And you're gonna say, I wanna go to any Marvel movie and dinner with my friends who are coming into town from Chicago. We're a very Chicago-heavy uh, uh, group up here. And uh, they like Mexican, we like Indian to take care of it, and they take care of it. Now translate that to healthcare. I just turned 50, can you figure out all the things I need to do and take care of it for me? Comes back and says, yep, here, here are all the recommended preventative things. I looked at your calendar. Uh, you've got these two days where you could do the prep and get your colonoscopy. Um, do I'm going to order the stuff for you and uh, pre-book an Uber or Lyft for you. Um, I think that the, um, the ability in, so we, we have six products that more than two billion people use every month, which tells you that the majority of our users are not in the United States. I think that there is a risk for the United States that in the same way that many countries skip to the landline phase of phones, and went straight to mobile, I think that we could certainly see um, innovation outside the U.S. in this environment seriously outpace the U.S., given all the things we've talked about, about the finances and the, the way that we're structured. I think that's a, that, that's a real risk. Um, the thing I worry about in healthcare, uh, particularly in the U.S., is that we have so many in, entrenched financial, organizational, guild, things that are difficult to let healthcare innovation happen. Um, the second piece I worry about is the adversarial use of these technologies. I think um, we heard from our colleague um, uh, in the Public Good um, Project how adversarial the information environment is. And, you know, there's a thing called, um, does anybody know Brandolini's Law? It's the, um, the asymmetric bullshit hypothesis, which is that misinformation is effectively free to create and debunking it is a very costly and energy requiring activity. And I think that that's, there, there's a risk that that will get worse with this. Um, and then the one other technical thing that I'll say that I have high confidence will exist within a year is true multimodal AI. Where you can say, oh, here's a photo of my EKG, here's a video of me walking, here's some text, and like interpret all of that together. I think that'll be here for sure. And then that will change the environment along. And since that's my research project, I kind of hope that does happen. Oh. So high probability. As a Bayesian, my priors are high. Thank you, thank you. Let's see what uh, GPT-4 had to say about this. And can, 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 I, can I say a thing about number five real quick? Go ahead. So I'll tell you our official corporate position, which is startling is that AI is too important to not regulate and regulate well. Um, that's the, and while we've been here, there was a joint announcement with the White House, Microsoft, OpenAI, Amazon, Anthropic, and two others about commitments around beginning to do this even in advance of regulation. And so I do think that the, the um, folks on my side of the fence really see the value uh, in number five. Okay, first question. Thanks, this is, this is great. Rob Roswell from Northwell Health. 
Um, this question may be um, directed towards Vinny in terms of medical education and AI. Where do you think it comes in terms of professionalism? For example, admissions to medical school, we we're talking about is it ethical if someone helped create their personal statement with chat GPT? And again, to be clear, not creating a different person, but using it to help formulate. I am, I volunteered here, I did these activities, I'm dedicated to, to medicine because I'm underrepresented. Can you start my essay and then I edit it? Is that ethical or not? Should we be using it to answer questions on board examinations, tests? Because remember, you know, we weren't allowed to use up-to-date calculators, those were all illegal. And now look at what we're doing now. So just interested in hearing your comments on AI and medical education. And just to keep this moving, let's only address the personal statement because the others okay. I think yeah. are obviously no. Right, no, that's a great question. And what I would say is that there is an important authenticity piece. And you know, I've asked ChatGPT to be like, write me a graduation speech. And it's gonna write me the worst graduation speech ever. And then it will give me the impetus to be like, okay, Vinny, you can write your own speech, you know? And so uh, maybe one day it will write me a Vinny Aurora graduation speech, but it's not there yet. Um, so back to the personal statement, I also am writing a book chapter right now. I know a lot of journal editors in the room. It says now, like for some, like for my book chapter, it says, did you use ChatGPT and how? So I think we've got to get to a world where we're not bearing that to be like some people used it and some people did it, but tell us how you used it. And we're already seeing that in colleges where college professors are actually integrating chat GPT into their courses. So you're actually testing competency with people actually evaluating what is the output and how to make it better. And the reason that I said what I said is that all the boards at this point have at least at some level asserted the role that GPT-4 can play. So that's out there in the public domain. The basic answer is Although MOC is a different issue, it cannot be used in the way in which you just described. People will do it, and if they get caught, they'll be penalized. I'll just say one thing. I, I wrote a paper that's in academic medicine that talks about this issue. And the personal statement issue is really interesting because if you are a patient who has limited English proficiency, or if you are a patient who has issues with dyslexia or writing challenges, you might really value the way that GPT-4 can actually help to clarify your point. We have to decide whether that's okay. Um, what I can tell you from the work that we've done this summer is the art of creating an amazing personal statement in GPT, which it can do, is very much based on your ability to generate a prompt, which requires you to still write something. You can't just say, give me a, a, a statement. It has to be authentic. You have to provide it with something, CV, resume, other stuff, and then it can do a good job. And even then, typically, people would edit it. So I think it's something we have to address, but it can do it now. Uh, Mike over here. So Susan Detzer from America's Physician Groups. So as I assume most of you know, John Halamka is now leading the Coalition for Health AI. And the key goal is to start to develop some guardrails in advance even of regulation. Curious uh, what you all think the top four guardrails uh, that should be created for the health system around use of health AI. I don't know, four, let me start with a few and then you know, <laughs> time in, you know. I think two things that immediately come to my mind beyond what was talked, I think privacy issue, data privacy issue, and I know Dr. Halamka's work and the Mayo Clinic platform, and what I wonder about is even de-identified data, who does the data belong to? When I go to a hospital or to a doctor's office and they take my labs or my history, and then they, who decides who has the ownership of that data, even if it's going into a big data cloud, de-identified platform. So having those guardrails about clear ownership of the data, and the more and more I think of your scenario, not only would I need to ask this, that I'm turning 50, it would know I'm turning 50 or whatever, and it would know all the things I have done or not done. So privacy issues, I think we need some, the guardrails about that I think a lot. The second thing I want to talk, which we didn't cover earlier, was this idea of explainability versus black box. You know, as medical, and plus it ties a lot into, we talked about credible information and trust. If we start to act on a recommendation guideline, whatever, that is produced by AI that neither it, nor its creators, nor its users, us as physicians or scientists can explain, then we become the propagators of non-credible, non-trustworthy information 
and it undoes all the things that we are trying to do. That, those are the two guardrails that bother me perhaps quite a bit. Others? I would just add, you know, it's similar, you know, my dad's an engineer. When computer-aided drafting came out, it was okay to use, but you had to say that it was computer-aided. Mm -hmm. So if you made a diagnosis that was AI-enabled, we need to be able to also disclose that to the patient so they understand. So attribution. Yeah. Right. Michael? I think there are, I, I think there are a few things. So first, um, we, we just uh, yesterday or the day before published a bunch of things that we think are important in this domain generally. So first around uh, privacy and security, and in addition to, as a, and here I'm taking the enterprise health system context, um, you should have in the US all of your things locked down in a HIPAA compliance stack. If you're in the EU, it should be GDPR under special circumstances of health, those things. There's a particular issue with uh, large language models in that as they learn from the data um, they adjust the weights and parameters in the models, and those can leak across customers. We've seen public reports of one chatbot's uh, histories leaking from users to another. And so you will, it will be important at the health system context to have technical and contractual controls that that can't happen. And it's a technically complicated thing to isolate the learning between, let's say, cloud buckets. Um, the, Second is that as a health system, if you do not have AI governance in place, you should be getting it in place. There's a reason that we publicly published our principles in 2017. Uh, about six, a few months ago, we shared the operationalization of that, of how we do it. Um, there are several kind of, I would say, leading lights in this place, in, in this space, in, uh, in the health system area. But governance of these is going to be different than governance of a um, a kind of AI that reads, you know, uh, does this lung cancer, does this uh, chest CT have lung cancer? I'm and going to stop you yeah. after this one. Just, just for more. Yeah, and my, my fourth is just, does it work? And figuring out if it works is going to be very important. Um, we published our first uh, thing on this uh, from this model called MedPalm in Nature last week, trying to show our work. Thank you. Other questions? Right here. Hi, um, Kathleen Noonan from the Camden Coalition. I can't wait for my chief of staff, by the way. Um, so my question is that one of the hardest things for us as an organization that works with people with health and social complexity is getting appointments. And we recently um, decided to bang our heads against the wall again and try to get all of our local health systems and CCBHCs, behavioral uh, health care centers, to actually share their behavioral health calendars and schedules with us. So what I want to know is what are you working on and how uh, is the health system going to be able to like actually take advantage of all these chiefs of staff in our pocket if we do not have public, public sharing of calendars we don't have uh, offices that actually book out more than a couple of months in advance, et cetera, et cetera. Permission to start this one and then uh, So one of, the, one of the fallacies about the way in which we will be able to use AI in medicine is that AI will be able to understand both the semantics and the syntax of healthcare. Scheduling is a nightmare in a way that has to do with our inability to disclose information around scheduling. So for example, Many of us may have uh, access to orthopedic surgeons in our organization, but only one of them actually ever does the particular procedure or deals with a particular complaint. Those data have never been externalized, therefore none of these tools will know that stuff. It's very private. And even if it was, these have been largely unsolved problems. So I think we could create AI to do some of these very specific challenges but we are gonna have to basically do the same work that we've yet to do already, which is to come up with an interoperable way to describe that challenge. So I think the answer is it lies in our desire to make interoperable data that can then be used to train those types of models. Any other thoughts? I, I agree with you. I mean, I think what, when you were talking, I think it's the data hygiene issue for AI to work on. Is our data clean, organized, available? and the interoperability issue. So yeah, I think that hygiene is, is, is key for 
AI to act on, on a set of data. Yeah. Yeah, I think the fundamental question is that, like when I was thinking about your wait time conundrum, I have the same problem also. And um, a lot of it is shortage of clinicians, you know, and now there's, you know, can't get at the appointments because they're all booked up and, you know, they don't even know who's going to be there <laughs> after that. And so um, can AI actually help triage, you know, help me figure out when do I need to go and, and you know, see the doctor versus not? And so are there ways that AI could be used to leverage and partner to, so that clinicians can spend, be more efficient? I don't know. I, I don't know that part yet, but I, I certainly think that the, it's not going to solve the workforce shortage problem you know, with, with nothing, uh, with just how it's functioning right now. No, Michael, thank you. I would imagine this is one where Google has, has since given it some thought, because this is a search problem in some ways. Can you comment on that? Um, when I give talks on this, I have a picture of my mom going in for chemo and then a picture of stuff in her house that we used to take care of her feeding tube of all the tape and all the like crap like that as a reminder that not everything is in the computer um, and technology is not going to fix like the fact that the tape always falls off around the feeding tube. Um, here, I think that there is a potential technical approach of uh, that you have agents on both sides of the fence. And so, you know, we tried to do, when I was uh, in Chicago, like scheduling optimization, and I, we had like 8,000 appointment types because there's always like some doc who only wants to see chronic kidney disease in people with rheumatoid arthritis for uh, 17 minutes on Tuesday afternoons <laughs> um, with a resident. And um, these models should be actually quite good at handling that. And so there may be a way, um, there, there may be a technical approach of a two-sided thing where they talk to each other in a way that abstracts the complexity out. So there are many things I'll be bad at, understanding the semantics of data without having to get it all in shape. I mean, it's not like the internet is clean data, right? Um, that's one of the things that these may end up being good at. That's great. Next question. Yes. Hi, uh, Daniel Yang from the Moore Foundation. Um, yeah. Michael, you, you quoted Bill Gates. I'm going to quote you, which is, you said that uh, AI is not magic, it's math. And uh, Kevin, you and I were at a meeting in Washington, D.C., where we heard Peter Lee say, um, ChatGPT is not a computer. Um, and, and that one of the fundamental fallacies or reasons why there's distrust is we have an assumption of perfection, like a calculator. You know, it should just be right. And so is that an issue? When we talk about trust, should the benchmark be perfection or should the benchmark be fallible human beings? I think augmentation, so sorry. No, please go ahead. I was gonna say, I think the best real analogy is self-driving cars. They're pretty clear they're better on average than people and yet uh, they're not everywhere yet. Um, and I think in healthcare, we're likely to demand similar things of um, definitive, def definitive superhuman low error rates. Um, but it seems like it's in a computer to me, um, I, I think. No, I was thinking it's, I, your chief of staff analogy really you know, resonated with me. I, I consider it more like an assistant, at least at this stage, an augmentation, a cognitive partner that as a human, you know, um, of course I'm, you know, we are f uh, fallible in terms of decision making, but we also have limited cognitive bandwidth it's only that much we can read, retain, recall. And if there is a tool that has a far greater ability to read, you know, um, scour the internet for everything, retain and recall, and be available to help me, I'm much more open to that. Uh, you know, it just goes back to this idea of statement and disclosure, you know, oh, perfection and chat GPT, you know, I, I think there was a famous painter, I, my art is very weak, Picasso might have said, all art is imitation. So I don't know, we start to blur some boundaries between original and imitation when it comes to chat GPT. But at any rate, I consider it as a, as a, an, a cognitive partner to augment my cognitive abilities. Follow on Here. question, if I may. So uh, someone develops a tool that race, uses large language models to develop a preferred sequence of tests. 
maybe even using the Mayo Clinic sequencing guidelines, patient follows that order of tests and a diagnosis is missed for some reason. Who gets sued? They, 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 I was going to say, Benny, Benny's best I, friend can I'm answer that question. Yeah. We'll say Google for now. There it is. Okay. Use BART. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, my name is Mark Schuster. I'm from the Kaiser Permanente Tyson School of Medicine in Pasadena. And um, so first, Michael, thank you for now helping me understand the difference between working at Google and working in academia. My chief of staff does not pick the Marvel movie for me to see or tell me the best Thai restaurant. Um, and I would I, love that. I, I would I would someday like to have a chief of staff. It's this like <laughs> aspirational goal off in the distance. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll talk to Karen DeSalvo for you. Um, but the question, well, actually, Rob asked my original question, so I have a second one. Um, we keep hearing um, in academia that medical education is broken and we need to fix it. Um, so I'm wondering, in five, six years, the, in between the two Bill Gates, two and ten, um, what, what do you anticipate we might be able to, what will we see in medical education, nursing education, education in general, that'll be so much better um, thanks to um, large language models? I can, I can start out and say, um, well, thanks for your question, Mark. And I think both all of us who are educators in the room know there's a lot of human labor that goes into things like assessment and training uh, physicians to be really good communicators. And as we talked about with those standardized patients. And so when I think about the, um, even here at ABIM, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations here about creating multiple choice questions and things like that. And so I, I think of how do we use AI and these language models to make our work easier, to make the decisions that we need to make. And so, so I think that's one question that um, I think a lot of the questions in medical education that I've been seeing are, how do we train physicians to work with chat GPT in the office? And I'm like, is it gonna be chat GPT in the office? Is it gonna be something else? Like, we don't know what that's gonna look like even in five years, but how can we already start adapting our current processes, which I don't think we're really great at because we kind of are, you know, sort of stick to the status quo, how can we already create our, assess our current processes and potentially one day say, this person's ready for practice and they don't need to stay here for four years and this person might need a little bit more time because we actually have better confidence in our estimates. So that would be, I would say, can we use the technology to actually make the work of medical education to produce competent doctors better? Great. I'm David Meltzer from the University of Chicago. In preparation for my question, I asked Chat GPT, is it okay to ask your wife a question at a scientific meeting? <laughs> it, it says yes, Congrats it's generally to okay to ask your wife a question at a scientific meeting, especially if she is a fellow scientist or has relevant expertise in the field being discussed. However, you must um, Wait, David, me, is the follow the appropriate procedures. So here's my question. I want to see your phone. It's, well, <laughs> It's all in here. <laughs> um, and so, so my, my question is sort of twofold. First of all, what do medical students need to know now or very soon about AI? And secondly, are there careers we should be telling them to be cautious about entering into within medicine because they're likely to be replaced by AI? So I'll start with the career question first, uh, and then I'm curious about everyone's comment for the question. So the career question, you know, and you know, married to David as a, you know, a disclosure. So the, uh, and also another one is he's an economist, so that's another disclosure. So, um, so I will say that, uh, as you know, the match and medicine is not a perfect market economy, and it's subject to a lot of rumor. And so if we start spreading major rumors, like radiology is going away, you, we will not match people into radiology, and you, you're we're seeing that now. We, you know, is anesthesia, EM, now radonc. So we're already seeing that. So I'm, I'm really um, not ready to um, say it's time to advise medical students about any specific career based on chat GPT. I think we should still encourage them to find out what they're really good at and, you know, pr proceed ahead with what their passion is. Um, I will say that to the second question, we should be training them on the fact that this exists and how to use it responsibly. And I'm thinking about actually Michael's, um, you know, principles, you know, like thinking about those ethical principles. We all have ethical courses. And so 
this thing has made plagiarism easier, right? So how do we how do we make sure we've um, you know coached our students the best way to think about these things um, and also value understand that our students are the residents, they're the value here. They're gonna teach us. Like when electronic health records came, it wasn't the senior physicians in the room that taught you how to put on those orders. There were the residents and students that were helping us out. And so, um, so I did wanna highlight that we should be co-creating and partnering with them to understand how are they doing it. And I actually asked our Pathways students the other day, uh, college students interested in applying to medical school, how are you using ChatGPT? And they're, they're using it. And so, so we should be asking, we're gonna be getting people who are already accustomed to this and they're gonna be helping us understand how to use their response. Go ahead, Mitch, she's speaking. Uh, I don't think AI is going to replace doctors, but I think doctors who use AI will replace doctors who don't. I think that's likely. It's like asking, would a calculator replace accountants, you know, or would Lotus One Two Three replace accountants? We have more accountants today. Just the work is very different. I think we have time for one more question. Is that right? Two. Two. Okay. East. Over here. Right. This is Tara Montgomery, Civic Health Partners. So I noticed when you typed, "What are the dangers of AI?" It gave five answers. Not one of them was about patient safety. I'm on the CHI group, um, the group Susan mentioned, that's so feeding into the National Academy of Medicine um, code of conduct on the use of AI in healthcare. I'm on this patient safety work group, and we have a very fast deadline. We've, it's a three month project to come up with all the things to consider of the impact of AI on patient safety. I'm not going to outsource it to ChatBT. I'm going to. I'm going to outsource it to you. What do we need to hear about potential risks to patient safety that we can in integrate into our work? May I start this one? In so I want to challenge at least one thing that you said based on my experiences so far, which is as an expert in patient safety, you would reference whatever material was available to bring to the fore your thinking. As a, you would love to have the thought exercise executed. GPT-4 is actually terrific for that. So I think it's wrong right now to not use GPT-4 and to ask that question. I wouldn't necessarily abdicate responsibility to GPT-4 to answer the question, but I would start out by saying, if I could ingest the entire internet and report back to you things that relate to patient safety that we ought to be thinking about, why would I not do that? That's point one. Point two, um, I think it's a very big issue. You'll note that, by the way, patient safety is sort of embedded in answers two and uh, three, so, and actually three and four, really. Um, but I think that there are way bigger issues, and um, certainly the way I would think about this is to use any one of a number of our rubrics around structure issues and process issues and outcomes issues that might affect quality and safety and work through how it could actually be used to both mitigate that risk or exacerbate that risk. But it's extensive. It's a long list. Other comments? I think well said. I think the only other thing I can say or rather in favor of how AI can mitigate safety risk is that we um, depend so much on these, you know, incident reports or event reports to understand patient safety globally. And it's a very manual, very unreliable, highly variable process. And I think AI, because of its ability to look at large amounts of data and detect patterns and hidden associations can probably teach us a lot more about how to do patient safety. I think the conclusions we have about what leads to falls, for, for all I know, are not really accurate. Maybe they are far better predictors of falls in an inpatient population that we can learn from AI to mitigate those risks later on. So that's just a, an additional point. Like, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Give me most of my career is patient safety and quality. So two threats and then one potential upside. Uh, the two threats are that uh, inequitable care is unsafe care. And so all the things we talked about before are really important. The second is automation bias, that people trust what comes out of the computer. And in particular, when it's in the middle of long form text, it is it has a much higher cognitive load to detect when it's wrong. So I think in the same way that EHRs reduced some kinds of errors and increased the rate of other errors, we may see that with AI. On the upside, my clinical practice was intensive care for many years. And any, are there any other ICU docs in the room? Yeah, been, ever been tapped on the shoulder by a nurse going, doc, do you really wanna do that? That is the most important thing. 
AI never gets tired. It's never sleepy after lunch. It's vigilant in a way that people can't be. And so the idea of the nurse being like, doc, you're really sure I can imagine a safety mechanism for AI in that way. I just want to add one uh, other thing, which is, um, you know, and this actually is a story that um, my, that involves Michael. I was there with Michael when we turned on this system where critical care rounding nurses were deployed to patients' bedsides for rapid response teams by not a nurse or a doctor, but by the computer. And the, initially, the residents were like, why are you here, you know? And, and we're like, did somebody call you? And it's like, no, the computer called us because the patient you know, had a, you know, a score that looked risky. And the residents hated it. And they actually didn't want to have anything to do with it and actually were like, oh, yeah, it's just whatever it is. And so I think there's also this risk that if it's too precise, we kind of it's like every other um, alert we over overlook. So just wanted to throw that out there. Now they love it. So just you know, wanted okay, to we have it. And to call a thing a thing, we did less CPR in the hospital when we did that. That's your final question. All right. Um, I'm Marianne Green. I'm the Vice Dean for Education at Northwestern. And I was at a clinical informatics meeting recently with a bunch of educators in the room, and they made an analogy to the pandemic. Everybody was feeling that this was like the beginning of COVID. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. The exponential piece of this is probably the most frightening piece of this for me. It's unsettling. So the question that I come up as an educator and would love, Michael, for you to maybe elaborate on your comment about AI is not going to replace doctors, it, w we are still teaching clinical reasoning on the basis of note writing. Okay, that's an extremely important way that a student learns clinical reasoning. We are teaching evidence-based medicine courses where students are asked to analyze the outputs of research. It may be that AI is going to be better at that than any human being will be better at that. So I'd love to hear a little bit more if you were in a position as a vice dean of education, how you would be preparing for the next two to three years um, and, and designing your own curriculum. Yeah, one of my early recruits to Google was a former uh, assistant dean of med ed for Harvard Ben. And so we've been, you might imagine, we've been talking about it a lot. I think that there, I think it's worth thinking in two big buckets. One is, um, what do learners need to know about AI? Do they need to know the, like, I, I wasn't kidding when I said you can manage hypertension without knowing that kidneys exist. It doesn't feel right to do that. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about what are the standards that we need for um, learners that will be resilient into the future. The second is how to use it. We don't know yet. So, so we have what is, um, you know, we, we have several papers on this AI that does medical question answering and is superior to physicians in blinded ways of doing that. We do not think that is ready for the clinical environment yet. Um, but it may be. And so how we're going to use a brand new piece of technology, we're going to have to sort that out together. And I don't have an answer for that now. Kevin may, though. He's thought a lot about this. Well, I will say, I'll say one thing, which is whenever confronted with a question like that, I think the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what is likely to already happen? Like what if you did nothing else in your environment? And what's pretty clear is that companies like Dragon and a couple of other companies, or Nuance, if you will, are producing tools that, that promise to decrease the risk of burnout by helping to summarize notes for busy clinicians, which means students will be reading notes that are generated by tools like DAX, which is Dragon's ambient prescription transcribing um, and others, and they ought to learn that process because that's currently, it's not unlike phlebotomist, right? I mean, it changed the way we think about what we should be teaching. I suspect we should be watching for other areas like that where machine learning AI, either generative or algorithmic, will be um, becoming a part of the interstitium of healthcare and making sure that we teach both what, why that might be a good approach, what some of the risks might be in terms of bias, et cetera, because these things are happening. These companies are being, they are talking to your CIOs right now, and there are contracts being written, I guarantee you, for DAX, guaranteed, because DAX just announced DAX Express which uses GPT-4 
to generate the entire note with very little training. It's gonna be everywhere. If you can afford it, you're gonna get it. There's a whole equity issue attached to if you can afford it, but that's another conversation. So I think it would be useful to make sure they at least learn that. And then I could, we could talk for hours about this. There's a lot of things I think we should be looking at organizationally around what are the competencies that we expect our students to have and how should those competencies change in a world in which we have this technology. And I think that's where the work begins.